Let's see if I can get this. There we go. But tonight, uh, we got a great turnout. Dr. Craig Cipolla. He is the Pitoretto Curator of North American Archaeology. I'm sure I um, slammed the pronunciation on that one. He's at the Royal Ontario Museum. He's an Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Toronto. And there he is. Craig, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Welcome, and thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you. So I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping everyone can hear my voice first. Yep. Okay. And you can see me a little bit and you can mostly see my slides, hopefully. Is, I'm, I'm hoping that's working for everyone. Beautiful. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, pronouncing uh, my surname correctly. Uh, most people that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that announced me or introduced me uh, do get it wrong. So thank you for that. Uh, and you got Vetoretto close enough. And, and I, I'm not the Vetoretto, so that's okay with me. But, um, you know, thank you so much for reaching out. Uh, thanks for everyone to, uh, uh, for coming. Uh, and asking me to, to talk about um, some research and writing that I did quite a while ago for me, um, especially in COVID times, it seems like um, time moves very quickly for, for me at least uh, with two little ones at my house and teaching at university classes for my house and things. So in any case, it feels like uh, my work and my writing uh, with Brothertown Indian Nation on Brothertown history was a very long time ago. So you'll have to forgive me as I work through this today uh, I'm working off some of that rust, but um, I was lucky enough to go back and read my book again and <laughs> figure out what I was doing uh, back in 2013 when I wrote that book. Um, now, on this opening slide, there's a bunch of images. Um, right here, I'm assuming you can see my cursor. Yep. But right here uh, in this little photo, that's actually a very large uh, Brothertown uh, communal cemetery. As, you, as we'll see in the talk, cemeteries are very important for the work I did. Um, but anyway, this is a, a large communal cemetery called the Union Cemetery in Brothertown, Wisconsin. Um, and then these other photos are all pictures taken in Connecticut. And of course, if you don't know much about Brothertown history, it involves a very uh, a large space, a move from places like coastal Connecticut, uh, uh, Long Island, Rhode Island, uh, out to New York, and then out eventually to Wisconsin. Um, now these other pictures here, show some of my work in between Brothertown and now I've been doing a lot of excavation with the Mohegan tribe. I direct their archeological field school. So these are my students, a few different years, uh, digging up uh, 18th and 19th century Mohegan households. And so we're actually looking at the people who stayed behind on the Mohegan reservation rather than the people uh, who went to Brothertown. And then this picture here is just an important, uh, this is a 19th century photo of a very important uh, Mohegan ceremonial place called Cochigan Rock where we've done a lot of archeology. span So yeah, when we talk about Brothertown history, when we talk about Brothertown archeology, span we're gonna deal with all these places and hopefully I'll be able to address that in the time period we have allotted. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to say um, greetings uh, from where I am now. I, I live in Toronto and uh, that's where I make my home now. Um, and I need to acknowledge, of course, that Toronto sits on the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit River First Nation, since time immemorial to today. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that the research I'm about to describe to you uh, took place on the lands of the Mohegan, the Pequot, the Oneida, the Menominee, and of course, the Brother Town. And I'm very thankful for my time there and for the things that I learned on that land. So all the proceeds, by the way, from this talk have been donated to the Brother Town Indian Nation. It's a very humble uh, gesture on my part, but uh, uh, I hope it it is appreciated. So today, and by the way, this is a photo from 19th century uh, Brothertown, Wisconsin. Uh, this, this is a, a Brothertown community member. Her surname is, is Dick. Uh, so uh, the Dick surname uh, is known to come from the Narragansetts uh, in, uh, in Rhode Island. And of course, this woman is living in uh, probably mid 19th century Brothertown, Wisconsin. Um, so today we're going to cover uh, basically a basic sketch of Brothertown history. Now I'm going to deal largely with the 18th and 19th centuries, but I'm also going to have to deal with the 17th and 20th centuries, so a lot of time periods. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, uh, the second point, we'll talk a little bit about archaeological insights into Brothertown history, though as you will see, uh, 
the work that I've done uh, on Brother Tom Lands is largely non-traditional in the sense that it's not excavation like the, the pictures I showed in the first slide. It's largely uh, above the ground archaeological uh, work, uh, looking at stuff that sits above the ground like cemeteries, right? And this is actually a, a version of the project that emerged through dialogue with the Brothertown Indian Nation in Wisconsin. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. And finally, the third point, we'll, at, the, at the end of the talk, we'll talk briefly about uh, how I think this work and this history uh, sort of leads us to think a little bit more about the future. Uh, not only the, the future of my discipline, that I've made my own discipline, archaeology, uh, which has a lot of problems with it, but I have hope for its future, but also the future of things like federal recognition process, because um, there's a lot of problems with that as well. So, um, as I said uh, at the, in the first slide, uh, you know, I haven't really written a lot about Brothertown in a number of years, at least seven or eight years. Um, but in the interim, I've been doing a lot of archaeology, like I said, with, uh, with Mohegan. This is a Mohegan uh, 18th century household, right, about the American Revolution time period. And I work at the Royal Ontario Museum, shown at the bottom. Uh, I'm a curator, and I, I work with a lot of collections, like these fabulous um, uh, Iroquois and smoking pipes. So I've been doing a lot of work that's related tangentially, but not directly connected to Brother Town. So I had to go back and remember uh, what I was doing all those years ago when I, when I uh, was involved in the Brother Town Archaeology Project. And of course, this is my book. I thank you for showing it. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight sort of deals with a fraction of that book. And uh, so if you're interested, uh, perhaps order, try to get the library to order a copy of the book is what I, I would uh, advise. Um, I'm not trying to make any money. I knew I wasn't going to make money as an academic from the beginning. So, uh, you know, try to get a copy through the library. Um, so the Brother Town Archaeology Project is something that started around 2007 uh, when I was a PhD candidate at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, at the time, I had been doing archaeology um, in coastal Connecticut and other parts of New England, where I'm actually from. Um, but there was always this missing piece of that, that, that really rich and vibrant history, uh, which is Brother Town, right? So this is a large portion of people that left uh, in the 18th century. And so um, I reached out to the Brother Town Indian Nation. I visited them and uh, they, I was warmly received and I'm very thankful for that. And um, it was originally designed, this project, as a, uh, uh, as a very traditional sort of uh, you know, field project where I dig a lot of houses up and, and, and talk about that, what lives were like at that time. And uh, in 2007 and 2008, as I continued to think about the project and work with uh, uh, elders from the community uh, uh, at Brothertown, uh, the project actually turned into an, another project, which was focusing largely uh, on cemeteries, uh, on commemoration. Um, and that came about because, of course, there was a lot of concern with losing inf valuable information that was uh, recorded on gravestones and in cemeteries. And so what I did was I, I documented all, or, or most, Brother Town cemeteries and gravestones uh, between New York and Wisconsin. And of course, I also did some work uh, on the East Coast, as I'll, I'll talk about, but not a lot of excavation at all. And basically, as I was doing this work, I was thinking about how all these, this information I was collecting, both in the archives, uh, but also uh, above the ground archaeologically, uh, how it told me about the formation of this new group, the Brothertown Indian Nation, from seven uh, reservation communities on the East Coast. And so that's a large theme uh, of what I was looking at and what I wrote about. And uh, this history absolutely deals with change. All histories deal with change. That's probably the definition of history is how we understand change, right? But it also deals with continuity, which is something uh, that's important to point out. And so it's a history of both cultural continuity and change uh, in the way I frame it, at least. And so I think it's really interesting when we think about any history uh, to see where a historian or an archeologist begins that history. What moment will they choose? And you have to realize when they make that choice, they recognize that it's not that simple. No histories have a single cause. There's multiple different causes that come together to create social movements and social changes. So, so I hope you keep that in mind when I tell you uh, sort of the moment that I start the history that I wanted to tell. And uh, I actually decided uh, when I was writing this history, 
my version of the history, of course, which by the way, I'm not a member of the community. I'm an outsider. Always remember that. Uh, but in any case, I decided to start that history uh, in my home, Boston. I'm a Red Sox fan. I'm sorry. I know there's a lot of New Yorkers probably in here. I apologize for that. But, um, but yeah, uh, in my home, Boston Harbor, a little bit before I was around though, 1768, where you get the red coats here. Um, and a humble ship kind of uh, lands on May 20th, 1768. And on that ship uh, is this person. Uh, ooh, sorry. Samson Malcolm. Now, many people associate Samson Malcolm as a, as a central figurehead of early Brothertown history, and I would never uh, argue with them. Uh, he's definitely an important figure in getting things moving. Um, but this is him. Uh, Samson Malcolm was Mohegan. He had a Pequot father, uh, a Mohegan mother, I believe. Could be getting that wrong. Of course, I'm knocking some rust off. But he was born on Mohegan land. And uh, early on, when he was just a boy, he went to work uh, with uh, Reverend Eliezer Wheelock. So this is a, a Euro-colonial missionary. And uh, Wheelock became his mentor early on. And uh, Occam is well-educated, he's multilingual, he becomes a Presbyterian minister. Uh, and he's incredibly um, charismatic, as far as we can tell. And he writes a lot, lovely. So all of his writings are published. If you're interested, you could look those up. I'm gonna share with you an excerpt from a letter in a second. But in any case, Occam uh, and Wheelock come up with this plan for the future of indigenous peoples. Of, of New England. I can hear someone talking. If you can mute, that would be great. Um, and I do apologize, by the way, if you hear any children yelling, that's my house. And I apologize. That's why I have these headphones on. Um, but that's, that's all for the fun. Uh, anyway, uh, as I said, Occam and Wheelock together uh, came up with this idea about a future for indigenous peoples in, in settler colonial America. I can still hear someone, by the way. It's kind of distracting, if you don't mind. Um, anyhow, um, they come up with this vision that, that involved um, educating indigenous people, spreading Christianity to indigenous people, uh, uh, teaching agriculture to indigenous people. Uh, and that was their plan for the future of, of native peoples in that area of current day New England. Uh, and with that idea in mind, Wheelock had the idea to send Samson Malcolm to Europe to do fundraising. And so he was in Europe for about three years and he was returning on May 20th, 1768. And when he was in Europe, he raised a lot of funds because he was charismatic. And one of the people that made a huge donation was called uh, the Earl of Dartmouth. Um, and this is important for the next slide. But in any case, this large sum of money that Occam raises for the indigenous people of New England, his home community, the Mohegan, his neighboring communities, the Pequot, that money is taken by Wheelock uh, and it's used to found Dartmouth College. So it's named after the Earl of Dartmouth, right? That's Eliezer Wheelock, by the way. Um, and of course, if you know Dartmouth College, it's in a place called Hanover, New Hampshire, which actually, if you look on a map, is quite a distance away from Uncasville, where the Mohegan live, or, uh, or Stonington, where the Pequots are, uh, or other communities that Occam wanted to, uh, to help. And although Dartmouth College absolutely early on has a strong indigenous component, it soon very quickly transfers to training uh, only Euro-American people to, to help spread the word. Now, Occam does not like this. So that's why I start my history in that time when he comes back, because he gives this money to his, his mentor, Eliezer Wheelock, and Wheelock uses it for something, and Occam starts to question his intentions. And that's actually where you get Occam starting to think about this plan that they had come up with together. And he makes his own version of that plan. And that version of the plan becomes the Brother Town movement. And this is, uh, by the way, as I said, um, if you love reading, uh, if you like indigenous literature, um, Brother Town writing is beautiful and, uh, and, and really fun to read. Uh, so I'm gonna, I don't, I don't wanna show you a lot of text cause that's a big uh, PowerPoint. Uh, rule breaking, uh, but, uh, but I do wanna show you this one excerpt uh, from a letter uh, to Wheelock from Occam, where he basically tells him what he thinks about what's happened here with these funds. 1771, we told them, the European donors, that we were begging for poor miserable Indians. As for my part, 
I went purely for the poor Indians and I should be as ready as ever to promote your school according to my poor abilities if I could be convinced by ocular demonstration that your pure intention is to help the poor helpless Indians. But as long as you have no Indians, I am full of doubts. So these doubts cause this rupture. And this rupture is not new. This rupture is related to old standing, long standing colonial tensions, which I'll get to in a moment. And that creates, you know, uh, you know urges Occam and many other leaders of the area to come up with this plan to re envision that future, that plan that they had come up with the be beginning uh, 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 as Occam was a boy learning from Eliezer. And I should say, there's a whole other host of raft of problems that, that emerge at this time that creates you know, tension between these two, between Occam and, and uh, uh, Euro-colonial uh, Christian society. But I'm not going to get into that today uh, unless there's questions later. Uh, you have to keep in mind, I'm a little rusty here, uh, folks. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, so Occam at this time in the late 60s, early 70s, that's the 1760s and 70s, um, is, is working around uh, New England spreading ideas about this new plan. And here are the seven communities that eventually contribute uh, to Brothertown. Uh, so you have uh, Charlestown, which is largely uh, Narragansett. Uh, you have Eastern Pequot, uh, Mashantucket Pequot, uh, Mohegan. Uh, obviously that's Occam's home where he lives at that time. Uh, the Nahantic and uh, the Tunxis living in, uh, in Farmington. And I also said, I don't know if I said Montauk, but Montauk. And of course, if you don't know, Occam actually ends up uh, marrying a Montauk woman, that, that is his wife. Um, so so uh, there's a lot of connections here. And he's spreading the word of this new plan at this time. It, it, it involves a lot of the elements of the initial plan, so European style agriculture, education, Christianity, but very important, physical removal from May, you know, from, from these, this massive center of, of settler colonialism on the East Coast. Now, of course, what they don't foresee is that those problems, those exact problems they have on the coast will follow them to New York eventually as well. But we'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, I might be taking a little bit too long. I'm, I'm realizing I, I, I'm, I'm waxing politically. Uh, uh, anyway, so uh, the plan is to try to move uh, and, 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 and find new lands and take uh, groups of, from these seven areas and move together and to create a new settlement that, that follows this plan that Occam is dreaming of. And um, by the way, this is, a, this is an 18th century map of, uh, of colonial Connecticut. I think it's 1755. Uh, I just showed it because I wanna talk about some of those tensions that pre-existed this, this particular history. So there's the reservation system, which is established in the 17th century. Uh, this is a drastic change from indigenous ways of life and histories before that time. Uh, it, it is restrictive to a small piece of land. It's usually the worst land in terms of quality for agriculture. It's a lot of rocky soils. Now, I always tell my students that come with me and toil on these lands and dig through the rocky soils for six weeks at a time. Thank you, students. Uh, that, that this is an experience. You're getting to learn what it's like to live here and try to make a living almost on this land. It's the rockiest soil. There's a reason why the Eastern Pequot Reservation is in a place called Stonington. It's because it's all stone, people, right? Uh, and so, so, so there, these are hard to sustain uh, a good way of life on. So, that, so people are impoverished. It's, uh, and, and that starts to create ruptures in communities, right? Because, well, what do you have to do to feed your family and your community? You have to leave to find jobs. There's a reason why when they wrote Moby Dick, they named the boat the Pequod. Well, that's because Pequot people were getting on that boat become whalers and they were leaving their home communities. That was really later in time, more in the 19th century, but it was happening in places like New London and Connecticut. And so many able-bodied males at this time leave the reservation to find ways of living. They join the army, they join uh, militias, they join, uh, they work on farms. And so you start to get ruptures in that community fabric. Also at this time in the 18th century, we have the Great Awakening. So you get the spread of indigenous forms of Christianity. You start to get ruptures on communities. By the way, I can still hear someone. Uh, uh, we get to start to get ruptures uh, in communities around Christianity. You have Christian factions and non-Christian factions on these reservations. And of course, there's general colonial tensions about, uh, you know, Euro, Euro colonial people uh, encroaching on land. And of course, the corrupting uh, uh, influence of things like alcohol, which of course does come up in, in Samson Malcolm's life. You, if you want to read about him, you'll, you'll learn that that's an issue that comes up, uh, at least in, in terms of uh, there's rumors about it at least. 
Um, so now, as you recall, my project is dealing with commemoration. So I'm dealing with um, cemetery practices and how people remember their deceased ancestors. That's what I looked at in Brothertown, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. But in order to, to contextualize that, I want to tell you what it looked like in the 17th and 18th century on these home reservation communities before we get to Brothertown, New York. So this is a representation of 17th century commemoration practices. Uh, by the way, there's not, I'm just giving you a trigger warning. There are going to be no images of human remains or no excavations of human remains that I'm talking about or showing. Don't worry. These are two bird's eye maps of 17th century um, Narragansett uh, cemeteries. So they're in Rhode Island. Uh, these are well documented. And those, those little uh, circles are actually showing the locations of graves and the orientation uh, of graves. And so this just gives you an idea of these practices in the 17th century. There's a couple things I want to point out. The first is you'll note they're all pointing in the same direction. They are pointing to the southwest. This is very typical for 17th century uh, New England, native New England. Uh, and when European people ask indigenous people, like Roger Williams asked the Narragansett, why do you bury the dead with their heads pointing that way? And he said, they say, well, Kentantowit lives that way. Kentantowit's house is to the southwest, or Kitan. It's this spiritual entity, this godlike deity. Uh, and you can tell that 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 entity lives to the southwest, because as you walk to the southwest, more and more corn grows. Corn is a very important spiritual substance, a plant for indigenous peoples of New England and beyond. And Contantuit, his house is where all the corn is. So the corn leads you to Contantuit. And so when the, when the deceased are laid to rest, part of them, a spiritual part of them, goes to the southwest to live in Contantuit's house. Uh, now, above the ground, these are not marked at all. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. They're not marked with any permanent any permanent form of material, like no stones or anything like that. Uh, sometimes you put a blanket or some clothing that someone owned above the ground, but of course those go away. They don't last forever. So they're not commemorating the deceased as individuals with markers uh, for each individual person. They just know the ancestors are buried over there. The ancestors are in Contantowitz house, that kind of thing. And also interesting to note, you don't use the name of the deceased once they're gone. So this, is a, this has to do with how you remember, right? You remember the ancestors as a whole rather than as individuals necessary, necessarily. You don't even speak the name. You don't mark the, loca the specific location. You don't actually mark uh, a stone with their name at this time. So that's just giving you an idea of what's happening in the 17th century. But of course, as the 18th century rolls on in New England, you get people like George Whitefield in, with the Great Awakening helping spread Christianity uh, directly or indirectly through many, uh, to many communities, including indigenous communities. And things like, excuse me, New Light evangelism become huge at this time for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, uh, it denies earthly possession. So this makes sense to people that are struggling to, 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 to feed their, their, their families. Uh, and it says like, in the end, if you're faithful, everything's gonna be okay. So you can get through those hard times on those reservations. So this <laughs> message resonates with many reservation communities. But also there's really interesting uh, work. You could read uh, the historian David Silverman's work. He write, he's written about Brothertown as well. Um, there's some really interesting parallels be, between how a new light evangelical preacher works in the sense that there's a spiritual force that just works through their body and that spiritual force just speaks through them. Kind of like how I lecture, you're getting a little sample of that now. That's why I keep my, uh, my students awake. But there's a parallel between that and how a shaman or a powwow might have worked in the 17th century or the 18th century. And there are ideas that those things are not totally opposed, right? So it's possible that the shaman of the 17th century might be the new light evangelical e indigenous preacher of the 18th century. Those, those roles are similar. There's a, there's a parallel there. So, so anyway, there are these awakenings. There are Christian, there's Christianity spreading in reservations, as I said. And of course, that's going to impact the way that you uh, remember the, dece the, the deceased and you commemorate things. Uh, these are showing uh, two cemeteries from the Mashantucket Pequot Reservation. These are much small, uh, bigger maps. So these little uh, circular things, again, are showing the locations of burials. And you're going to note right away, there's a change in orientation. They're no longer facing the southwest. The Great Awakening comes and they're facing the west. That's, of course, because the deceased are now laid down on their back. 
the tops of their head facing the West, second coming of Christ, you can just sit up and meet, uh, meet him. I don't know if you know, that's why we still bury people in many Christian cemeteries in that way, but that's actually part of it. Um, now, uh, one thing that we don't have here still is we don't have a lot of above the ground marking in a permanent form, although it does begin in the 18th century that occasionally graves, most of them are unmarked above the ground in a permanent fashion. But a few, occasionally you'll start to get uh, graves that are marked with uh, groups of stones, sometimes a singular stone, sometimes a handmade stone that looks like a gravestone, uh, or it is a gravestone, but it's not made by a professional gravestone maker or anything. It has no words on it. Uh, and then right in the 19th century, you start to get occasionally stones with actual people's names on them, like you would expect in many cemeteries. So that's what commemoration looks like in the 18th and 19th century. Okay, the other thing that's going on uh, in cemeteries, outside of cemeteries, I should say, is that there's other forms of commemoration uh, with indigenous peoples of New England and beyond. Uh, there are uh, these stone piles that you might actually see out in the woods in New York, wherever you are. It's, but certainly you'll see them uh, in New England. And um, recently the United South and Eastern tribes, now this is a conglomerate of federally recognized uh, 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 tribal nations, uh, along the East Coast. Uh, they, they, they have a resolution from 2007 where they basically say that these are prayers in stone that are often mistaken by archeologists and state historic preservation officers as efforts of farmers clearing stones for agricultural or wall building purposes. That's because of course, in places like New York and New England, you have these heavy freezing and thaw and Toronto, by the way, a heavy freezing and thawing cycles that push stones up into the, the, the dirt. And as farmers are working those fields, they find those stones and they throw, they remove them to the side. They sometimes make uh, stone walls out of them. So they are, they are absolutely sometimes part of field clearings, but actually um, they're also ceremonial features that predate Europeans uh, and exist throughout European history in North America. Um, so indigenous peoples do make stone piles for non-farming reasons, uh, especially in New England. These are often for commemorating certain events uh, or places. And so again, this is another form of, of, of remembering. And if you look hard, you'll see that Eurocolonial peoples have always recognized this. So you can go back to the pilgrims and they, they note, oh, there's Wampanoag people here in Massachusetts piling stone. Why are you doing that? Uh, and they don't really get a clear answer because it's probably none of their business. <laughs> uh, you get people like Ezra Stiles, who became the president of, um, eventually the president of Yale University. He was all around New England looking at what indigenous people were doing in the 18th century. He sees them making these stone piles. And you even get people like Frank Speck, who's a famous anthropologist, who also went to the University of Pennsylvania way before me uh, in the early uh, uh, 20th century. And he sees people making these stone piles and I see people making these stone piles too. So it's a long tradition of remembering people, uh, remembering events, remembering places by piling stone. And so that's another part type of commemoration that we see certainly. Okay, so I, I promised to talk to you about Brother Town and I will, I, I, I just went on for a, a while there. Sometimes when I don't talk about a subject for, for a long time, I tend to, uh, to over-elaborate. Uh, so let's start looking. Now we know about this New England context. Now we can start looking at, uh, at moving away. Uh, so, in, uh, so of course, Brothertown, New York. And if you go around uh, current, uh, what, what is now, what was Brothertown, New York, I should say, uh, you will see all kinds of historic markers. I don't know how many are still up, um, but you can see here that uh, um, uh, some of these are Oneida County uh, uh, historical uh, or Department of Public Works, I should say, but they are definitely celebrating Samson Ockham as part of that brother town history. And of course, Samson Ockham's house still stands in New York and that marker is still there. Uh, um, so we need to talk about what was going on in New York. Well, uh, as Occam formulated this new plan, uh, representatives of these, these New England groups started to travel out to New York and talk to the Oneida who were there. And in uh, 1730, so 73 and 74, they have a, a bunch of talks and the Oneida agree to deed a certain amount of land to this group that would become the Brothertown Indian Nation eventually. 
from these seven New England communities. Um, and in 1775, they actually start making the move, meaning that they, sell, they send uh, able-bodied people in the spring, late winter, spring, to start setting up shop. Now, of course, they are horribly disrupted by this little thing uh, called the American Revolution, uh, where, uh, you know, the Oneida uh, and the brother town uh, were on the American side of things, whereas uh, uh, the Iroquois were, were pro-British. And so there's a lot of violence in New York. Uh, so uh, as that started to happen, the, the people that were setting up shop, so to speak, in Brothertown, New York, retreated uh, to the east, and they ended up going to sort of the uh, right uh, the Massachusetts, New York border to Stockbridge, and they made relations with the Stockbridge community, indigenous community there. Uh, and eventually the Stockbridge, when it comes time uh, to move back to Brothertown, the Stockbridge go to, to Oneida country uh, and, 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 and move there as well. But in any case, uh, things don't really start moving again until a few years later in 1783, where they really start moving from these seven communities again and relocating and setting up this new place that becomes Brothertown, New York. Um, now, as I said, some of the problems that I outlined and mentioned in New York do not go away. They follow them uh, to New York. To New York. Uh, sorry, I was talking about them in New England. They follow those uh, them to New York, and uh, they 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 sort of follow Sam Smockham as well. And and uh, uh, he's not widely celebrated by the entire Brothertown community while he lives with them in the, in the 80s, 1780s, and 1790s because he's taking some risks. And he's doing things that not everyone agrees with because he has a very particular vision of how to be successful because he understands how colonialism works and he has a vision for, for how the community is going to, to survive. And so Occam doesn't actually get there until about 1789. He's moving back and forth and he's, he's getting up in age at that time. He, he dies a few years later, 1792. But in the 1780s and the 1790s, uh, there's some controversies surrounding him in the community. And there's two major ones that I'll, I will uh, bring up. Uh, I think in the end, most brother town people in New York probably would come to mm -hmm. agree with, with Occam's stance. Uh, I'm sorry, I can hear you also if you could mute. Um, but in any case, at the time, these were points of conflict within the community. The first is that as... Uh, as, as Brothertown and, and Stockbridge, by the way, start to set up these new settlements in Oneida lands, there's some disagreements with the Oneida and, and the Brothertown because, of course, initially the Brothertown had agreed to a certain size of land, a certain amount of land. And the Oneida said, well, now everybody's coming out as refugee indigenous communities are coming from the coast. They're moving west. They're moving in here. And we want you all to share the land equally. But Occam is hard, he has a very hard stance on this. He says, no, 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 no. We get the initial amount that we agreed upon. And he pushes very hard. And some community members are worried that after making this treacherous move, you don't have cars and trucks and things, right? <laughs> after making this treacherous move, uh, which took a long time because the American Revolution interrupting everything, right? Uh, they'll have to lose all their land because he's pushing too hard. But in fact, he keeps pushing and he's successful. Uh, and so in 1788, the Treaty of Fort Schuyler formalized a lot of things, but one of it, the things uh, it does is, it, it, you know, Occam's fight for that land is, is secured. Um, it secures around 25,000 acres for that community. And that's, uh, you know, that's the amount that he wanted to fight for. And so that's one piece of, you know, uh, of controversy where the community wasn't so sure that they wanted to be that fierce with their argument. But the second piece of uh, disagreement uh, emerges around the issue of leasing land, right? These are, not, uh, these are not lands held in what we call fee simple. You can't sell the land, right? But you can lease it. You can lease your part of it to a Euro colonial farmer. Now Occam does not agree with this because he sees it in the long term as bad because you know if you lease your land for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years, what ends up is you lose, you lose the land is what he's learned in New England. He's right. Uh, and he, so he has a very hard stance against leasing. And then there's another Brothertown uh, leader, uh, 
uh, Elijah Wabi, I hope I got that right, who actually is pro-leasing. And so you have two factions of Brothertown. One is pro-leasing, one is against leasing. And so this, uh, you know, not everyone is celebrating Occam's very hard stance on this during these times. I think in the end, they're probably happy that he took that hard stance um, because uh, there was these continued land struggles. Um, and then a set of acts just uh, at the end of Occam's life that were, were passed uh, that basically regulate and restrict leasing, which is great. Uh, he's very happy about that. Um, but eventually they do end up losing a large part of the land in the last of these acts, I believe, 1792. Um, and basically that 25,000 acres I mentioned before is split up and 9,000 acres is, is left for the Brothertown community to live upon. And the rest of those acres are sold off to Euro uh, colonial, often farmers. Um, and the, the funds uh, from those remaining, that land that was sold off actually goes into an account that the community uses to purchase that land from, uh, from the Menominee, sorry, the, the, the Menominee from the state we now call Wisconsin. It wasn't the state of Wisconsin at the time. So that's going to help fund the next, uh, the next really big move uh, as the 19th century starts to happen. Um, but with this 9,000 acres, they break it up into 149 individual lots. And we can actually see in the archival record who lived where, and we can see where they came from and things like that. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, you know, part of my uh, 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 interest in telling this story is seven communities becoming one. Well, what happens with those seven communities? Uh, and so you can actually look at... Um, at the, the, the maps and see how these seven communities are distributed or not. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. The other thing that we have at this time are we have religious factions. We have different forms of Christianity being practiced. We have Quakers. We have other forms of Christianity within the Brothertown community. And you should note that Deansboro uh, in New York uh, actually gets its name from a man named Thomas Dean, who was a Quaker schoolmaster who lived with the Brothertown uh, in the community uh, at the turn of the century, so into the 19th, into the 19th century. Uh, I think it should just be called Brother Town, if you ask me, uh, make things a lot uh, uh, easier, but uh, that's my personal <laughs> stance. Um, okay, so as I said, you can look at these maps and you can get some interesting ideas of how the communities break up. Now, don't get upset. Uh, these are very confusing maps. I'm gonna tell you what they say in a second, but I've done like a lot of statistical analysis here. And these actually show the different communities. So Narragansett, Montauk, Mohegan. So where people came uh, from in the East Coast and where they ended up and it's color coded. And basically I've looked at this by decade and looked at how the different communities distributed in the new brother town. And we can see how this changes through time. Now I'm gonna go through this pretty quick, but then I'm gonna summarize it, so don't worry. So this is 1800, 1810. And I think these could be fabulous like quilt patterns at some point mm -hmm. if, we, if we ever do that. Um, 1820 uh, and 1830. And so there we have all the maps I just showed you up ahead, uh, up at the top. And basically what we see here, even though you, it's hard to actually see visually, but you can see it uh, mathematically that in the first few decades, there were loose sort of Narragansett, which are dark blue, Mohegan, which are the red, and Montauk uh, sort of neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods, as time passes, people intermarry, uh, children are born, they start to break up as, as people live together for a longer time period. And then, of course, at the end of this, people move to Wisconsin and they get a chance to reconfigure these, these different uh, neighborhoods if you want. Uh, but these clusters do actually eventually break up. And that's obviously, that makes sense because as we uh, go through time, we don't have people actually thinking of themselves as Mohegan or Narragansett or Pequot. We actually do have people thinking of themselves most likely as simply Brother Town, which makes sense, right? We're going from seven communities to one. Um, now, in terms of commemoration, if you remember some of the patterns I showed you on the East Coast, um, in New York, most graves, as far as we can tell, are marked above the ground with permanent markers. They rarely have words on them. They don't have names on them. They don't have dates on them, rarely. Um, so most, this is very typical for a Brothertown uh, marker in New York. Uh, so these are blank, mostly limestone, handmade. So they often have like a rough, 
uh, sort of what we call the outer sort of cortex of the rock still showing on some of the edges. And then one side might be uh, shaped a little bit. Uh, they don't have any uh, words again. So what I'm saying here is, um, I do believe that this actually relates to a deeper tradition of how you commemorate the dead and the ancestors as a community of ancestors rather than just as individuals. Um, and this gives you all the different shapes. I, these have numbers on them just because that's how I keep track of them, but they come in all shapes and sizes. And of course, these stones do break sometimes. So that's what they looked like um, in uh, 2007, 8, 9, 10. Um, but what's really interesting here is we have this sign. I showed you this earlier, but uh, uh, I'll let you take a, a look at what it says. So uh, Samson Ockham, uh, he's believed to be buried in the cemetery a uh, quarter mile south of here. So Samson Ockham is this figurehead uh, of Christianity in New England in general. He's a leader of indigenous peoples. Uh, so this, this figurehead of the brother town Indian nation, we don't know where he's buried. Is that because people didn't like him? No, it's not. It's because he was buried in a traditional brother town way, which does relate to traditions on the East Coast. He wasn't, he, what, they didn't purchase a stone that has his name. They have a blank stone that marks where he, most likely a blank stone that marks where he's buried. The only reason someone has, has hypothesized he's at one stone and not another is because there's a really big stone. But, but who knows if that's true or not, we don't know. The point is that this is, there's continuity here with some of the traditions that I've talked about uh, on the East Coast. Even Occam, the most famous of Brothertown people, uh, certainly on the early Brothertown history, is not commemorated in a new way, but a co commemorated in a more traditional way, I would say. In any case, uh, as time moves on, we do have the beginning of people purchasing uh, gravestones uh, in the 1830s and on. Uh, we do start to see uh, people buying more traditional, uh, what we think of as what you'd expect in a cemetery, a colonial style cemetery or something, where you get people's names and their death dates uh, and life, death, life dates, I should say, and other things. So we start to get that transformation in Brothertown. Uh, New York. Now we need to also look at, um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, of course. I'm having some issues with this. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, we also have to look at the next move. Now, as I said, a lot of the land troubles that were taking place in New York, uh, sorry, in, on the East Coast, um, did not go away in New York. And so they started to experience some of the same problems they had uh, back on the East Coast in New York. And so in the early 1800s, members of the community start looking west again, and they are joined by the, uh, the Stockbridge uh, and the Oneida. And they're looking for land. They initially agree to some land uh, of what uh, we call now the state uh, of Indiana, which is actually um, uh, falls through because of the War of 1812, uh, some ramifications related to that. In the end, they, 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 um, they reach out to the Menominee of current day uh, Wisconsin and the initial agreement is to uh, uh, get some land around Green Bay, uh, uh, quite a large piece of land for the brother town. Um, but eventually that, work, that doesn't work out either. And they end up going a little bit south to where brother town Wisconsin sits today, right here uh, on the east side of Lake Winnebago. Uh, in 1832, uh, there's this thing called the Sta Stamba Treaty, where a small piece, a smaller piece of land than they agreed upon is established here uh, in Brothertown, Wisconsin, uh, which is called today Brothertown, Wisconsin, by the way. And by the way, uh, just down here at the tip um, of, of Lake Winnebago is Fond du Lac, where the Brothertown Indian Nation has its current tribal offices, uh, which I haven't visited in a long time. And I'd love to come back in non-COVID times and visit uh, to say hi, uh, if I'm ever in town. Uh, so this is actually a historical marker uh, in, in Brothertown, Wisconsin. Um, I'm going to ask that you don't read it because it's distracting, uh, but um, it basically summarizes a lot of the history I just went over. Um, in the 1830s, the community begins moving again to this new place in Wisconsin. Uh, in only seven years, more than two thirds of that New York population has moved to Wisconsin. And by the way, it's, it's important to note that some Brothertown people's never leave Brothertown, New York. They stay there for the rest of their lives, but most of the community does move. And we actually do have a small portion uh, of, of Brothertown uh, peoples who actually moved directly from the East Coast 
right to Wisconsin. They skipped New York. So they moved there in the, in the um, 19th century. And this new land in Brothertown, Wisconsin was heavily forested at first, but it was excellent once they cleared it, uh, excellent for growing. Eventually they do switch to a, a heavy uh, wheat, um, uh, wheat production. Uh, they actually end up creating, building two, uh, two of the mills, uh, two new mills that, uh, in the area, a lumber mill to clear, help clear that land and, and a grist mill. Um, they actually create the first Methodist church in Wisconsin territory, founded in 1840. Now, unfortunately, uh, the, the church does not stand anymore. It's actually underneath, uh, underneath a, a very well manicured lawn and, uh, the landowners, did not want me to visit them. <laughs> I don't take offense to them. I'm an archaeologist. I like to dig stuff up. It's okay. Um, but um, um, so that's just some of some aspects of Brother Town, Wisconsin history. Um, as you might have predicted, uh, in Brother Town, Wisconsin, and the various uh, Brother Town cemeteries, shared cemeteries as well. Um, Brother Town uh, commemoration changes yet again. Uh, it changes largely uh, to um, professionally made, usually uh, gravestones uh, that were purchased. Uh, these all have, most of them have names on it. Most of them have dates on it. They come in all kinds of shapes. They have obelisks. They have large marble uh, markers like this. They also have more humble gravestones. They're more traditional sort of gravestones. Um, and, but even when you have um, these more, you know, uh, sort of, purchase gravestones from a professional carver. Uh, most likely they're buying these from Fond du Lac. I've got some advertisements from uh, stone carvers at this time in the 19th century in Fond du Lac. Um, uh, even when you have these types of stones that are made uh, by a professional carver and they have a very Christian motif, um, I would argue that there's still shades of sort of traditional uh, indigenous New England here. Um, so this is Hannah Dick Stone. Hannah Dick um, was born in Brothertown, New York. She died in Brothertown, Wisconsin. She's known uh, by the community as this very stubborn <laughs> uh, woman. Uh, when you speak to her in English, she answers you in Narragansett. <laughs> and, um, and this is the stone her family uh, put up for her. And this little epitaph, I think, is really interesting. Uh, I think the reference to corn, although, of course, that has a presence in, 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 in the Bible, of course, and in early Christianity. Um, but it also has a very important meaning for uh, Algonquin people, uh, for, for many indigenous people. Um, you know, the root word in, in Algonquin language, uh, grave, earth, mother, and planting corn are all related, right? You're putting some of the deceased into the ground. You grow corn out of the ground. Corn is an important spiritual uh, plant for indigenous people. So there's a connection there, possibly. Um, that's something, you know, I would probably argue, but you could take it or leave it. Um, now, with, um, with uh, settlements, um, this is the Wisconsin settlement. It looks a little bit bigger than the, the, uh, the other settlement in New York. It is a little bit bigger. Uh, when we look at the settlement pattern here, at first you do have like loose Narragansett and Mohegan neighborhoods. And in fact, you also get a loose cluster of pink and green here in the south central part. Uh, these are Pequot peoples, but these Pequot peoples never lived. Most of them didn't live in New York. They actually came directly from uh, Mashantucket and Eastern Pequot reservations um, in Connecticut and moved directly to Wisconsin. And you can actually see that they still had, um, they still had their neighborhoods because we do have uh, things like this really interesting, this envelope um, uh, that comes from Brothertown. And as you can see, uh, the, the, the address is Pequot, Wisconsin, right? So it could be thought of as a little neighborhood of the Pequot. And perhaps they're thinking of it in a neighbor, as, as a neighborhood because they're, they're newcomers to Brothertown. Maybe everyone else sees themselves as Brothertown at that time. Maybe those Pequots who are freshly from the East Coast see themselves only as Pequot. Who knows? Uh, it, it, that's debatable. Um, so this is the current day um, uh, tribal flag of the Brothertown Indian Nation. I think I'm supposed to stop talking soon. I will. Don't worry. No, you can uh, keep going. Okay, okay. I, I have no idea. Like I just, uh, you know, with Zoom, 
I, it's very strange. Like I'm a lecturer who likes to make eye contact and see what people are doing. And right. so I'm just talking into a black box. It's kind of a lonely uh, situation. So, so uh, just, so, just so you know, um, we have a hundred participants. The room is full. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing an interest in, uh, in this fabulous, uh, fabulous history. And, and um, so for those listening, just one more thing. Um, for those listening, we are going to, this is being recorded and we're going to have it available on YouTube. So if you know people who were trying to get in or couldn't get in, in about a week, we'll have it up on the Oneida County um, YouTube channel. Over to you. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So this is the, the, the current um, flag of the Brothertown Indian Nation of Wisconsin. Uh, I've been told that there's seven um, feathers here for a reason, uh, that it relates to those seven communities on the East Coast. Um, there's a Thunderbird. Uh, there's a Christian cross, cross, I'm sorry, there's a Calumet smoking pipe, um, and um, of course the Algonquin name for Brother Town. Iam Kwitu Wakanak, Wakanak is, uh, I, I'm very rusty at that, I haven't said in a long time, I, I apologize. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about history in, in Wisconsin and what happens up to the present. So in, in 1830, the larger backdrop of what's going on in the, in the U.S. is the Indian Removal Act passed by uh, by President Jackson. And uh, this is an effort to push all indigenous peoples on the, uh, to, the, to the west of the, the Mississippi River. And so uh, you can see the effects of this act all over the place. I mean, where I work currently uh, with the Mohegan, uh, you can see that they built a church, uh, the Mohegan church. And that was an effort to, to hold on to that land and to show them that, you know, they, they deserve to stay there because they were they were changing with the times or uh, things like that. But in most cases, uh, this the passing of this act made a lot of people nervous, and I would imagine it made a lot of Brother Town uh, community members nervous after having moved from Wisconsin to uh, sorry New York to Wisconsin, and um, eventually uh, in the next uh, ten years, in 1839, they petition the U.S. Uh, government and they ask to become citizens. And as far as I know, they're the first indigenous community as a nation to become uh, U.S. citizens uh, with land rights. Well, we got some uh, technical difficulties. I don't know what's happening. Uh, anyway, um, at that time, they become U.S. citizens with land rights. Now, I think um, in the more recent Brother Town history, people are going to interpret this decision as some sort of forfeiture, forfeiture of their sovereignty as an, as an, as an indigenous nation. Um, I, I don't, I never read those documents in that way. Uh, I didn't see it that way, but many people see it that way. Uh, um, um, and we'll come back to that in a second. But in any case, at this time, um, they, they start to own their land in fee simple so they can sell land and they can pass on that land to their kids, right? So this is the first time they can do that. Um, and, and again, this actually coincides with the way that you remember your community of ancestors because you can prove your, your ancestry with that grave, those gravestones now more than you could back in New England, right? Um, now in the second half of the 19th century, there's all kinds of things happening. There are land sales. So Brothertown uh, community members are electing to sell their land sometimes. The Civil War happens. Many Brothertown men go to the Civil War to fight and they do not come back. So that's a huge impact. And there's a dispersal of Brothertown people. So they start to move out. And in fact, in Brothertown, Wisconsin today, as far as I know, I could be, I could be wrong. There are no Brothertown Indian people who live in Brothertown, Wisconsin. Uh, the, the, the tribal uh, offices um, are in Fond du Lac, which is not too far away. But, um, but whenever we would do work on the land in Wisconsin, it would take a long time for everyone to sort of meet up because everyone was coming from far away because there was a dispersal of the community. And of course, recently, and when I say recently, I say uh, more than 10 years ago, they were denied federal recognition. And, uh, and I, think, I think that's a, that's a real problem. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, Kathleen Brown Perez, who, who's, who's a scholar and a and Brother Town member, um, has written really evocatively about this, and um, it's a, it's really uh, it's a shame that this has happened. And I feel that it's the system has really let people down, uh, unfortunately. So 
so thank you for making me try to remember my research <laughs> uh, uh, about Brother Town. In summary, what I'm trying to say here is that I think this is such a fascinating history and I, I, it's absolutely been a privilege to do this work and to write these histories and to think about this history and do this field work. Uh, but it's a history of resilience and adaptation and, 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 and certainly it's a history of change. As I said the, at the beginning, all histories involve change, but there's a lot of continuity as well, I would argue. Um, and I think really important for this history is the notion of individuality, how we remember our ancestors as individuals or as communities. Um, and how we relate to the land. That, that 1839 decision um, to relate to the land in a new way that was sanctioned by the federal government um, had implications, right? And so uh, being able to, to pass on that land or to sell that land, that's a major change uh, that the Brothertown community has persisted through, by the way. Um, and so we've seen some of these issues with individuality, relations to land, in cemetery patterns I talked about briefly, in the residential patterns, uh, and, and in land rights that I, I talked about. And also a lot, a big part of the book that I didn't talk about because people tend to not get excited when I give public sort of talks for the general public, is that of course you can look at Brothertown authored histories. You don't have to take my word for it. You can read the histories by Sam Samakam. You could read histories by someone like Joseph Johnson, who is someone, I didn't mention him, but he was a really, um, uh, he's just had a really interesting life. Uh, or, or people like Thomas, Thomas Cummock, who's Narragansett, but moves to Brothertown late in, uh, late in the history in the 19th century, and he writes that history. So take their word for it, don't take my word for it. Um, but I also like to say, even though I didn't spend a lot of time on it, um, I think that this is an excellent example of a collaborative project, although I admit that it was not as collaborative as I would have liked it to be just because everyone was so, all, I, including me, I lived in Philadelphia at the time when I did this work. Everyone else was dispersed, so it, it was hard to get everyone together to actually do the work together. Um, but, but, you know, this is uh, some, some pictures of some of the work I've been doing since then. These are Mohegan lands with Mohegan students and also uh, English students and, and American students. Um, and um, this type of work is really important. That's something I wanted to sort of uh, end with. And uh, the work that I'm doing now with the Mohegan is of course something I learned how to do that work by working with the Eastern Pequot, by working with the Brother Tom. And so I thank them for that. Um, I think there are a lot of implications. Many people think of archeology span and history as about the past, but I, uh, I don't think of that in that way at all. It's not only about the past elites, it's about the present, it's about the future. I think, you know, the, when we do collaborative archeology, span when we do um, research with communities, we're training that next generation. So the next person who writes a brother town history doesn't have to be me, it could be a brother town mm -hmm. person, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can get a way of collaboratively rethinking colonial history together. I learn things about colonialism and my own history all the time through my indigenous colleagues, right? Uh, and through my English colleagues, by the way, one thing I didn't say is I spent about five years at an English university, actually in England, right? They have a very different understanding of colonialism than we do. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm American, right? I'm about to be Canadian. Um, that's breaking news, by the way, don't tell anyone. Um, and I, I think also this, this work um, gives us ground to rethink uh, the inequities of the federal recognition process. And if you think I shouldn't be talking about that because I'm a scholar, well, then I don't want to be a scholar because that's, that's what I need to be talking about, right? Um, you know, um, uh, in the, the denial of federal recognition, which I, th I think is 2007 or 2008, I can't recall. I'm sorry about that. Um, that was bad scholarship. There's a 500 page document and it was bad scholarship. They actually cited me and they cited things that don't exist. And I've told them, and you can read about it in the last chapter of my book where I say it, you know. Um, and, and so not only is it, is it poor scholarship, it's, um, it's an unfair system, um, but, but that's just my soapbox. Um, and by the way, um, you know, for those of you who tuned in to hear about a, a really dirty and gritty archaeological history with lots of digging, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint. But that doesn't mean, uh, that, that's me standing in a, you know, a meter deep cellar fill from the 18th century, doing what I love best. Um, um, 
you know, I think that if, if it would be wonderful if the Brothertown community and if, if local landowners of New York or Wisconsin ever had the interest to do that archaeology, to do a traditional archaeology project like the one I'm showing, uh, and they wanted help, please call me if you think I could help, because I would love to, to participate in that, by the way. Um, thank you very much for listening. There's a lot of thanks here. Thank you to the Brothertown Indian Nation. Uh, to a lot of people who gave me money to do this work, um, to the University of Leicester, where I worked when I, uh, when I wrote Becoming Brother Town, and the University of Pennsylvania, where I used to be a graduate student, uh, to the Mohegan tribe, who I continue to learn with today, and, um, and all these other people. So uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, I, I think I might have gone a little long. That's okay, but, uh, Craig. But if there's type, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If anyone has a question or two, I can probably try to address it. I might not be able to address all the questions because a key time is happening uh, in my house soon, which is my kids have to go to bed. And I never, I'm never late for that. <laughs> That's my favorite time. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, thank you very much. So in the chat, first of all, thank you so much, Craig. This exceeded my expectations. As I said, I, I'm fairly new here and I thought I had an idea of some of what was going on. And the more you know, the less you know is what's going on. But in the chat, I wanted to point out, um, hold on, we got a couple here. Greg Cook, as one of Hannah Dick's descendants and Thomas Comic's great, great, great grandson. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, here's another question. Do you know how many people moved? from Brothertown, New York, to Brothertown, Wisconsin? And how many uh, people stayed? I have a, I, uh, I don't know the number off the top of my head. I, I apologize for that. I do believe it's in the hundreds, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but I don't have a, a, I don't want to give you an, a totally inaccurate uh, number. So I'm not going to give that to you, although it is written down. Um, but I, you know, the people who stay behind, it's harder to track them, but it, it, it's not a huge amount. But again, I'm not going to give you a number because I don't want to give you a false sense of confidence <laughs> in those numbers. So I do apologize for that. I should have uh, written that down. Are you able to see the chat? Um, yeah. So where are you in the chat here? Uh, so Someone let me see. Caput ni. P-A-P-U-T-N-I. Does that make that sense? Means thank you. Oh. That means thank you. Yep. <laughs> so I had a question. Did they develop a, a third independent language? Um. They, so that's interesting. Um, no, well, they were big English speakers. That was a big part of that initial vision that Occam came up with. He, you know, you have to read and write in English. Um, I do believe that, uh, I, and I'm not an expert in this by any means, but I do believe that um, uh, there are sort of Algonquin kind of different versions of it kind of came together at Brothertown. And there are certain words that are different from, say, Mohegan, but I don't think it's an entire language, but I don't want to uh, emphasize that too much. I, I don't think it's completely separate, but I, I think it's probably to the stage where there are probably certain words that are slightly different than you get at some of the East Coast communities. And that actually could be because it's related to other indigenous groups in New York or like the Menominee or other groups uh, where people are interacting and sharing knowledge. But, but that's, uh, that's all speculation on my part. <laughs> um, Have you found African-Americans living among the Brothertown people? They actually have discussions of that in New York. Um, there, there are examples, yeah, of, of, uh, of people of African descent living in the community. Um, there is discussion, um, I know I wrote about this in the book. Um, there's discussion of if they're part of the community or not w within official sort of brother town, like the town book that they had in New York. Um, and I think they do, they are quite strict in who, who's a member of the community and who's not. And they do really trace it to that ancestry on those seven East Coast communities. So if you, you didn't have that ancestry, they would mark it as not necessarily part of the group. Um, in Wisconsin, I don't have a lot of knowledge of that off the top of my head. Said, <clears throat> this is building on the language question. Were the Algonquin dialects similar enough that the seven communities could speak to each other, yep. or was English their common language? Uh, they could speak to each other, absolutely. So, so Algonquin, um, there's Mohegan Pequot, so three of the communities, Mohegan Pequot and Narragansett, are very, very similar. Um, Montauket, um, I would imagine there might be slight differences between Mont Montauket, Tunxis, um, uh, and some of the other communities, but I think 
with the English and then a common base of Algonquin. I'm, I'm sure they could speak Algonquin to each other. And certainly people did speak Algonquin uh, in Wisconsin. It was not gone. Like I said, with, um, with Hannah Dick, um, she, she, like, I love that story. It's, you know, I, every time my husband says something to me in English, you know, she answers in Narragansett, which is lovely. Um, uh, yeah. A few years ago, I came across a book entitled Forgotten Allies, the role of the Oneida in the American Revolution. Do you know the role that the Brothertown Indians played? In the American Revolution? Uh, not as much as the Civil War. They did, I mean, they had members that, um, they certainly supported the efforts. I think they were largely involved in this other effort to sort of relocate at that time. So there's not a heavy participation as far as I know, but again, I'm not a historian that studies that. But like when you see the documentation from the Civil War, there's all these letters, fabulous letters. Actually, there's a, bu a book published by Carolyn Andler, who is a Brothertown uh, archivist. Um, she she, um, she published a self-published a book I think it's called Letters Home, and it's all the letters from um, Brothertown soldiers who went to the Civil War, writing back to their 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 families uh, in Wisconsin. So, so, um, so I I don't see a, as heavy a, a participation in the American Revolution. But again, I'm not a history of I'm not a historian of warfare either, so that that could be a problem. <laughs> One of the things that I should note is that the, the some of the violence that springs up around the American Revolution in, in New York State is most likely responsible for the disappearance of this very young, talented Brothertown man. He was actually Mohegan born. His name is Joseph Johnson. Uh, he died when he was, I think he's 21, when he, he just disappeared, when he's starting to, to, to found Brothertown, New York. He was actually Samson Occam's uh, son-in-law. He married, I think, Tabitha Occam. I could be wrong about that, but that's what I think. Uh, and in, in fact, um, he just disappears. Early, early on during this time. And you can actually read um, his diaries. It's, they're published. Uh, he has a book, uh, it's published under the name For All My Indian Brethren. And you could read about him. And he just, uh, he was just a, a charismatic, just like, um, like Occam, I think it seems, uh, but unfortunately disappeared because of that violence. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Raven writes, it's so thrilling to hear about the history of my tribe. I'm currently admin in the very active Facebook page if you need any more information. Um, thank you for keeping our story alive. Uh, when they were denied federal recognition in part because they chose to become US citizens with land rights? I think that was part of the argument. I think, I think all people that go up for federal recognition, the 20th century is always very difficult um, and this goes for like, again, all, you know, uh, you know, if you look at Eastern Pequot, um, which is another group that was actually given federal recognition and taken, it was taken away. Um, so Eastern Pequot and Stonington. Um, so the 20th century is very difficult because um, it, you need to show a certain amount of textual evidence that shows political organization and cohesion. Mm -hmm. And so that's always gonna be difficult uh, for most indigenous groups in the 20th century for a number of reasons. Um, but I think, I think that um, that decision of 1839, so, you know, like I, I, I was referring to that, you know, just having discussions with people who live in Brothertown today, their understanding, people who aren't Brothertown community members, but own land, own the land today, they would say things to me like, well, they're no longer a community because they, they, de they, they decided not to be that, you know, brother town in, in 1839. And I would say like, I don't think that's how it works. <laughs> People don't just disappear, but I think that's a popular perception. And I do think I would have to go back and look at the, the what they say in the documentation of denial, but I do believe that factored into it. Um, and of course that 1839 decision does shape what the 20th century looks like in Wisconsin because that, that ability for the community to be together, to hang together, to demonstrate a certain level of political organization is very difficult because of that they're being pulled apart in certain ways. And it comes back to some of that, dis that decision in 1839. Although, as far as I'm concerned, there's, there's all kinds of evidence that the community has cohesion throughout that, that history. Of course, I don't wanna uh, imply anything um, otherwise. Um, let's see. 
I own land that is supposedly to be Brother Town originally. Do you know the actual dimensions of the land in the current time? I also have ancestors who founded Farmington and Southold, where these Indians originally came from. So you had a pretty good map there. Yep, I have those maps. Um, and and uh, by the way, those maps are based on documentation in the New York State uh, archives. So uh, historical archives. So um, so yeah, they actually do have um, uh, fairly good. Uh, they don't have like more modern co coordinates on it, but you could probably um, what we call in archaeology ground truth the mm -hmm. corners of that settlement um, to figure out uh, where you're. Is it if it's New York land or Wisconsin land? Uh, certainly Wisconsin, you could definitely do it. I think in Wisconsin it would. Be, uh, sorry, in Wisconsin it would be easy to do, and New York would be a little bit more challenged. But I think you could still do it. Okay, you uh, think we got two more. Do they have any oral history of helping people escape from slavery? Yeah, so I'm not a, a community member, and so I recognize that I don't know that I don't know that oral history as well as uh, as the community does. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't. I have never heard of that. Um, but again, that's not something that I was actually looking into. Um, so I don't know that for sure. Why did they choose the name Brother Town? Um, well, Brother Town, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> There's actually another Brother Town in New Jersey. Um, and actually, so that had Lenape people there, Lenny Lenape. And two pe I think two students, uh, two Lenny Lenape uh, young people came from that area and worked with Eliezer Wheelock as well at his school. He actually had a school in Connecticut called... Um, Wheelock's Indian Charity School. I was actually going to dig it up with the Mohegan, <laughs> uh, but uh, the town of uh, where it sits now in Lebanon, Connecticut, they did not want me to dig up their town square, which I don't understand why. Uh, why don't you want a giant hole? Uh, but in any case, um, the actual schoolhouse where they um, attended school still exists. The actual structure still exists, but they've moved it away from where it was. So they don't know where it sat originally, which is a really mm. weird archaeological problem. But in any case, what I'm saying is, I think that term actually originates in Wheelock's ideas, like uh, many people coming together, their brothers, um, um, that kind of thing, coming together to create a new community. Um, but, I, but there's no clear um, uh, documentation of those decisions, by the way of why to name it this or not. Uh, last one, <laughs> I think I know the, any totem poles? No. No, nope, that's a wrong wrong part of- uh, Northwest Coast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, but um, there are there are totem poles elsewhere. Uh, nor yeah, the Northwest Coast, you can get some, right. uh, see some. <laughs> well, Craig, on behalf of everyone in the United County History Center, uh, this has been fantastic. We totally appreciate your time and your efforts to preserve the story. We have, oh, we got another one coming in. Some people online were actually from the nation. Um, and yeah, we're just gonna have to let you go put your kids together, but we appreciate <laughs> your time. And um, thanks again. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate uh, for you uh, bearing with my kind of rusty memory of everything but um it was really fun remembering and um and uh thank you very much for taking the time on a on an evening to uh to listen to me ramble on <laughs> so thank you i'll leave the chat open for a little bit as i shut it down somebody sent a picture i don't know what it is but you might want to look at that craig i don't know okay all right so i'm gonna shut it down here thank you everyone we'll talk to you soon oh. thanks again craig thank you very much